Uh, welcome everybody to our talk this evening with Hazel on 10 Steps to Localization, Becoming People of Place. Um, and uh, I'm Melanie Midland with Siski Permaculture, hosting along with Kara Taylor, our other partner in Siski Permaculture. The three of us are collaborators in that interesting activity having to do with teaching and advising people in Southern Oregon and beyond. Um, and um, yeah, there's quite a few people, more people signed up for this than are actually here yet. So maybe there's some more coming in or maybe they're all gonna ask for the recording. But um, I would invite anybody who's not familiar with these kind of Zoom webinar talk things to, you know, look at their bar on the bottom of their screen and see the little button that says chat. And while we're having the talk, if you have some questions or comments that you would like us to revisit after Hazel's done storytelling, you can write them into the chat. Um, and Karen will look through that at the end um, and um, uh, tell Hazel about them. And we'll also have an opportunity for people to ask questions live. So unless Hazel takes up the entire two hours of the story, which probably. <laughs> um, so let's see. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Hazel before we start storytelling. Um, Hazel is a longtime resident of the Southern Oregon Mount Shasta bioregion, first settling here in the early 70s, and has been advising farms, stewarding forests, and teaching environmental sciences for more than 50 years. Their focus for this 21st century has been social forestry, restoring oak pine savanna and Little Wolf Gulch near Rouge, Oregon, demonstrating natural building, fuel hazard materials utilization, multiple products woods crafting, biolife support, and desert forest water management. After having earned degrees in forestry and systematic botany from Syracuse University and SUNY College of Forestry in 1969, Hazel taught wild edible plants and woods lore at Lincoln College in Oakland, California in the early 70s. Then after helping Bill Mollison teach the first permaculture design course at Evergreen State College in 1982, they've been instrumental in teaching and spreading permaculture practices and have taught dozens of permaculture courses over the last 37 years, primarily in Southern Oregon and Northern California, with a few visits internationally as well. Hazel holds four permaculture diplomas from Bill Mollison's Institute, as well as two from the Permaculture Institute of North America. In conjunction with Siski Permaculture, they now occasionally teach a local weekends permaculture design course in Southern Oregon and advanced permaculture courses at Wolf Gulch Ranch in the Little Applegate Canyon. Hazel was once known as Tom and is the author of Greenwood Ho, Herbal Home Remedies, an Ecological Approach to Sustainable Health. Hazel has organized and supervised the development of several permaculture farms and woodlands and has done hundreds of walkthroughs of farm and homestead rainstorms. And Hazel presents local talks and stories on a variety of topics. These storytelling events have unfolded visions of the Siski Mount Shasta region in the 22nd century. You can find videos, audio recordings, writings, and articles on our Siski Permaculture website, which has a wealth of information. And so I usually would do a territorial acknowledgement, but Hazel's going to do a territorial acknowledgement. So I'm going to skip that part. Is there any other housekeeping you need, Karen, before we go on? Um, no, I think we're good. Awesome. Well, Hazel, I think that you could say hello. <laughs> Are you going to put me on the main screen? You're on the main screen. There you are. Mm, I see Karen. I don't see me. Well, I see you. What do you see, Karen? I see Hazel, and maybe Hazel is just not set up with the speaker view. Let's let me like just fix that because otherwise it'll be very disconcerting. Say something. Hello. What's going on? disembodied. I have a feeling we might have, have some kind of a weird thing that has to do with the fact that you're on my computer. 
We did can, it before. Can you stand not to see yourself as the main thing You're right there? Will that do? I was going to do fancy hand things and stuff. <laughs> you have to see everybody. This is more like looking at the room. Oh, okay. okay. I've okay. got a, I've got a crowd. All right, good. Okay then. Um, good evening. And um, when I wrote these notes up two, three days ago, I went to bed and I couldn't sleep. And it was because I realized that this story is in context. And if I just told the story from my original notes, some people might not understand exactly what I'm talking about. So I have a page of caveats or context notes, and I'm going to repeat them a little later in the storytelling. So first, um, I'm going to tell three stories. Uh, the stories are my ancestral heritage, or we'll call it traditional people of place. Then I'm going to talk about the cultural experience of ecotopian becoming ecotopian culture becoming place based. And then I'm going to talk about the 10 steps um, of of becoming people of place. And I'm and I'm calling that uh, new settlers orientation. <clears throat> so I hope this all works out. Um, a lot of stories that I've been telling are weaving a basket about becoming people of place. So this, this story is kind of contained in the other stories I've been telling. So it has a context, a context of stories that I've been telling, a context of place, which in this case is Northern California, Southern Oregon, or Greater Ecotopia. And, um, and, and so that means that the way that I'm talking about, about becoming people of place is based on this place that I've been in for so long, for 50 years. So that's, that's got to be said. So you understand if, where I am when I'm saying these things. And, and then in order to get where we want to go, what we've been teaching is there are three stages, quick fix, retrofit, and ultimate vision or ultimate. So I'm going to be going to ultimate. That's where we want to know where we're going. Even though there's a lot of retrofit that has to take place before we can really dig in, become people of place. And so I wanna kind of go through those briefly and maybe some questions will come up later. First, a whole bunch of land reform is gonna be necessary before we can do ecological restoration. And oh my God, that's retrofit. And it takes a lot of planning, takes a lot of doing, it's unimaginable, but it's one of the caveats for this story as I'm telling tonight. I expect massive land reform. And I also expect that the transition period is going to have to involve a whole bunch of institutions coming together and cooperating and coordinating with each other. Again, almost unimaginable. Somebody's talking to me, something, okay. Sorry. And then um, we need people to be willing workers in order to dig in to become people of place. This is quite a thought. Are you all ready to work, to become workers? I hope I work until I drop. I've been working so far, it's been good for me. I recommend work. So that's a caveat, right? I've got work involved here, just saying. And um, I also think our land use 
the way we're living here or the way people are living in Ecotopia right now is they're really scattered. They're all spread out. And I'll talk more about this perhaps later. Really, we need to be in very small villages and hamlets with completely defensible space around our inhabitation. Um, lots of villages and places and forests have irrigated land and gardens around the village that keep the village from burning down or burning up or burning over, your choice. Um, so that rural density pattern is entirely different. And that means we're going to be salvaging materials from a lot of abandoned mech mansions. So goodbye to the mech mansion is one of my caveats here. Isn't this, this is hairy, right? So here we go. And then we need caretaker stewards on land parcels as part of transition. So most organic farms, a lot of these McMansions um, have untended forests. And so far, most of the forest work of becoming learning how to be in place has been on federal land. It's been on wider, extensive landscapes. And we really need to start doing this on private land while we get rid of private land, but more on that later. And then lastly, my ultimate vision and the part that I've been intrigued by with people I've been working with is called hoop culture. It's a semi-nomadic way of moving around the landscape to do the ecological restoration work and then having a winter camp. So we should think about preparing or pre-prepping the infrastructure for a bunch of different ways of living in place. So those are my those are my caveats to begin with. And now I want to do acknowledgement. So here in Northern California and Southern Oregon, we have multiple tribes. And they were all removed from their homelands under force of arms by the US Army. Treaties were negotiated but never approved by the Senate. So these are unceded lands of sovereign first nations. That's a mouthful. And I want to read from an essay, which is on our website, which I is attached to the story, which you can read in full. Only first nations people get to re-indigenate. They return to the homeland that they know so well through their traditional ecological knowledge, through their storytelling. New settlers need to indigenate to become peoples of place. So that's a little vocabulary detail there to get straight. And then we here now admit that we are settlers on the unceded territory of First Nations, where treaties retaining sovereignty forced on survivors by the US Army at the time of the removal to reservations were never ratified by the US Senate. We now need never forget to recognize that First Nations retain traditional rights of access to cultural uses of their places. Now that's a heavy acknowledgement. We all need to think deeply about that. I tried to state it as strongly as I could to try to be clear about that. Um, the, the new people who have arrived here, the settlers, as I'm referring to them, brought with them their ways and tried to force those ways or make those ways work on this unfamiliar territory, um, this place of, of Ecotopia, and they blew it. They didn't know how to be here, but remaining First Nations people 
have a lot of knowledge that we need to learn from in order to be able to live here sustainably, to thrive, to, to do ecological restoration. So I want to admit that a lot of mistakes have been made. So this is acknowledgement. And we're hoping that our allies and our neighbors are ready for this job of actually learning how to be someplace. What does it take to learn how to be someplace? Now, I didn't mention all the names of the tribes and their rivers and the places that they stewarded, the drainage basins, all these small tribes and extensive tribes lived in drainage basin collections. They had dialect differences and they're listed in this essay, which is on our website. So I'm kind of moving on, but I've met quite a few of these people. Um, so we're going to start with traditional culture of place. And my sister Jennifer has uh, done some, she's a retired librarian, uh, state of New York, and she has done some research as to what happened with colonization. And um, I, I want to tell my family's story because it gives you a sense of where I learned or to think about being people of place. Um, my, my first ancestral um, families were the Fish family and the Sisson family. And they arrived with the Puritans in Massachusetts in what is now Massachusetts. The Puritans very quickly went after the Quakers and it was not pretty. And the Quakers had to negotiate um, a, a way to be safe. So they talked to the local um, tribes and negotiated to form the Plymouth Colony. So the Plymouth Colony was a Quaker breakaway resettlement um, in, in negotiations with the local tribes. And this became big trouble when the Quakers told the First Nations that the Puritans were not dealing honestly with them and were lying to them. And that triggered King Philip's war. So that was a little tricky. The Quakers were like just trying to tell the truth, but that triggered a war. And the, my ancestors, Charles A. Sisson, had moved to the extreme outside edge of the Plymouth colony, which my family has kind of had as a model for now 400 years of living out on the edge. And, um, and the, the warriors sent an envoy to tell us to get ready to evacuate. And so my ancestors did, they took their metal, their copper pots and pans, they put them in a bag, they sunk them in a pond and they split for Rhode Island. And then uh, that family, that first Sisson family had several children and many of them immediately moved to upstate New York to the Mohawk Valley where I grew up in above Albany in the upper Hudson Valley. Um, we went as Quakers and settled on a war path. So the next war that we went through was the French and Indian War. And that's the famous story of the Eastern, the Eastern meeting, which is called the White Feather Meeting. And the White Feather Meeting, um, when, the, when the armies were coming, Again, the Quakers First Nation allies warned the Quakers that armies were coming through. The Quakers sent their animals into Vermont, into the Green Mountains, put out their latch strings, laid out food on tables inside their front door and went to the meeting house to worship, to wait. And the first 
The first scouts that arrived were Abenaki or Abeniki, depends on how you pronounce it, Algonquin speaking people. And they surrounded the Eastern Meeting House. And it's quite a famous story. And the Quakers just sat there. And so they were asked by the scouts, what are you doing? Well, we're worshiping the great spirit. And they said, cool, can we join you? Sure, if you stack your weapons outside, no problem. When that worship session had deepened, there was then a sharing of food and all the Quaker families were given white turkey feathers to put over their barns and their houses. And the, and the Algonquin peoples said, you'll be fine. The white turkey feathers will let everyone know. So we survived. Uh, well, the Quakers did some other things like block the roads, cut down trees to slow down the military. But anyways, that was that was a big thing. The, the French and Indian War. And and then came the Revolutionary War and then came the War of 1812. And they all marched through the Champaign, Lake George, Upper Hudson Valley, and the Quakers had to adjust and adjust and adjust. And then came the summer of 1816 and froze to death. And my ancestors, the Sissons, were now parked up in the edge of the Adirondacks and a volcano went off in Indonesia, causing a nuclear winter in the Northern Hemisphere with incredible loss of life all over the Northern Hemisphere. A fourth to a third of all humans died of starvation in the year 1816, 1817. My ancestors had a solution to survival, which was they were farming in the remnants of food forests planted by either Mohawks or Algonquin people. And they had several types of oaks, several types of hickory, um, American chestnut, and they were wind pollinated trees. So even though it snowed and froze every month of the year that year, they no crops were able to be grown. They could put their pigs out on the mast that the nut trees grew. And that's how my ancestors survived. There are Quaker cemeteries in Glens Falls where every single gravestone says 1816 on it. My culture was traumatized by this, not just the wars they had been through. And we lost some of our land sense. My mother told me mistakes were made culturally after we had been through so much trauma. But by the time I was a child and my, and my siblings, two, two other brothers and a sister, um, we were now knowledgeable people of place and we were taken on children's pilgrimages. And we went up to that land, to that food forest and did walks through those forests, to the remnants of those forests. And stories were told to us and the stories of the names of the plants were told to us. And everything that we did, that how we walked, how we talked, how we were in the woods was always um, ended with, this is how the Indians did it. Thus, we should learn how to be here. And that was our children's pilgrimage. This is how we were taught. And in, the Quaker meeting, South Glens Falls meeting, which still is in operation, miraculously, just got a new pastor. We had First Nations pastors. I remember Thomas Corneliuson, a giant Mohawk, when I was very young, three, four years old. And he helped me a lot because he spoke to me directly. And I was ready for that because my family was teaching us where we were and how to be where we were. So I just wanted to tell that story because I'm now carrying that story and I am now using that idea of one of the most important things we do is with the children. 
these children's pilgrimages are so important to introduce people to place, to learn how to do this. So, um, I'll just say that a whole bunch of things happened out of that because, um, and the book that I want, I want to mention two books right now. One is Shell Game by Jerry Martien that talks about how the wampum peace belts were misunderstood by the new settlers. Wonderful book, Jerry Martien, Shell Game. And the other book by John Mohawk, Aquasasni Notes published it in 1978, is called A Basic Call to Consciousness. And this is the First Nation statement about place, in this case, upstate New York, but um, very, very important document. Very, very clear about these things that I'm talking about. So when I, during, um, during Vietnam, during the war, um, we had a Buddhist monk from Vietnam in sanctuary at the Glens Falls Quaker meeting. And I spoke just enough French to be able to be educated by him about the situation, which motivated me to become a, a Quaker medical relief activist, taking medical supplies and money across the border into Canada, which were then transshipped through Japan onto wooden boats um, and taken into Haipong Harbor and other parts of Vietnam for civilian relief medical work. And there was no Doctors Without Borders in those days. It was the Mennonites and the Quakers who were doing that work. So, by, so that caused me at, at Syracuse and at the College of Forestry to be in big trouble. And I ended up being on Nixon's uh, enemies of the state list. And I was completely blacklisted and blackballed, tortured, put on trial for treason. I went through hell. And then I escaped. So I am a refugee, a political refugee on the West Coast. And when I arrived in Berkeley, Wonderfully, there was a Berkeley Quaker meeting. And so I had elders continuity. As a people, the Quakers had multiple levels of age. And those elders who had been through the Second World War and the Korean War were able to calm me down, give me good advice. And then I had a leading and meeting we should help out the occupation of Alcatraz Island. We have treaties and continuity of conversation with First Nations. This is our opportunity. And so indeed, we took a boatload of, boatload of supplies to Alcatraz Island. And that has given me street cred to deal with First Nations on the West Coast. I ended up teaching at DQ University in Davis, which is the American Indian Movement. The American Indian Movement formed on Alcatraz Island. And Alcatraz Island was, how did I put it? A place for all tribes. So there had been a giant removal program to take First Nations people off of the reservations and put them in urban areas, which included the Bay Area. And these tribes were not used to talking to each other. And the American Indian movement didn't exist until after Alcatraz Island was occupied. And then they started talking to each other. And eventually that formed um, DQ University, which was a coalition between the uh, La Raza, the uh, um, Latino uh, activists, and the First Nations uh, who had been on Alcatraz Island. This was, this was a big thing and has really paid off. And we're all benefiting from that now. And First Nations have come back together. And there are now many colleges on reservations and associated with First Nations. And so um, I was very privileged to have some small part in, in seeing this happen. So all praises to this. 
This is all going to help us understand what it means to be people of place. Okay. <laughs> I think I'll move on. There was that story. In brief, all of us have ancestral stories. They're hard to find. I only have this continuity of story because of my culture. And I wish all of you all the best in finding out who your ancestors were and what happened. Because all of us, First Nations, all of us are suffering from ancestral trauma. We've been displaced, deracinated. We have work to do. Find out what it means to be people of place so we can do ecological restoration. So now I'm going to try to move through this ecotopian experience because um, the Vietnam War resistance, which was very complicated. There were people who were crazy. There were people who were trying to do relief work. There were people who were trying to be Gandhian, very peaceful. And then there were federal infiltration to cause trouble, to make it look like there was um, armed resistance amongst the hippies. Instead, we, we called ourselves freaks in those days, not hippies. Um, we started a counterculture. We started to build alternative institutions. Those institutions came under, under a lot of pressure. And that caused us to think, oh my God, we're gonna have to go back to the land. So that was the back to the land movement. And the back to the land movement were clueless. They were just going out and finding abandoned farms in Northern California and Southern Oregon and going, let's make some communes. And then they started learning because they had to talk to local people. And they that included First Nations people, but it was mostly loggers, cowboys, farmers, miners. A lot of knowledge of place was gained helter skelter that way. Um, institutions that we started to form in the Bay Area moved into small towns that would be natural food stores, clinics, free clinics, nonprofits, uh, writers clearing houses. I mean, a whole bunch of ecotopian uh, back to the land institutions were developed and then the institutions to connect the local institutions were developed. Provender, Tilth, um, it went on. Um, and we had a lot to learn. Okay, I got that. I want to give a shout out to the Planet Drum Foundation, Peter Berg and others who did the mapping, who started to teach us about drainage basins and started to teach us about um, um, bioregionalism. And that was place thinking. And I had been hired off the street um, in 1971, I was still blacklisted, um, to teach at Laney College. Um, a sign-up sheet had been put up for wild edible plants and woods lore, and 40 people signed up, and I was drafted into teaching it. I had no idea this was happening. It took six months and the teachers union to get me a paycheck. But I then had access as a college instructor to the Berkeley, to the University of Berkeley archives. And that included films that had been made of processing acorns, processing buckeye, basketry, a whole bunch of different uh, indigenous uh, skills of place. So I was able to, to give a little bit of knowledge to the back to the land movement for about four or five years. And then I myself, moved to Southern Oregon. So this ecotopian experience has brought us to thinking about being people of place and having the concept, um, being able to talk to other people who were trying to be people of place uh, before us as we were the most recent wave, the, the hippie back to the land movement, the ecotopian back to the land movement. Um, I want to mention Country Fair, 
in Eugene, outside of Eugene because a lot of um, place-based uh, intercommunication happened there between artists and craftspeople. Uh, we got a sense of a larger regional placeness that was useful. Um, then we started the environmental movement out of Earth Day came forward. Um, I wanna give a shout out to a play called Queen Salmon that toured the Northwest coming out of the Matoll River Basin um, where citizen science came to think about eco restoration and what it takes to get the salmon back. So all of these things were back to the land, ecotopian place building, cultural place building. And, um, and, and so this story I'm telling now is about emergent ecotopian culture becoming a culture of place. During this same time, the First Nations uh, peoples started to come forward. Part of that was actually facilitated by Earth First. There were a few Earth First uh, rendezvous where First Nations people were present and the conversations were excellent. So I do want to mention that there was a lot of, especially Dennis Martinez. Um, and we went through the timber wars and the wilderness areas started getting designated. And so a whole sense of where we were. And now we're dealing with fuel reduction because of the damage that was done by inappropriate forestry following the removals of the First Nation practices. Big mistake, huge mistakes were made. So we have repair. And luckily we have remnant First Nations who are in, in communication with us. We're, we're all in this together. It's gonna take all of us to do the work. So this is that message that I want to say. Emergent anthropology, young visionaries. Now we're visionaries. Now we're dealing with climate change. We need to adapt to place, not become refugees and try to move someplace else. We need to figure this out, and that means a whole new way of living, different kinds of buildings, different kinds of food, everything. So I'm going to get to that in the third story. We're still in the second story. And I want now to read you some sources for this. Black Elk Speaks is an example of visionary work, place-based. All of his visions were high plains, upper plains visions. So that's a, that's a good example to look at for place-based visionary work. For what it is, there's lots of controversy around it. A Sand County Almanac, Aldo Leopold the beginnings of the eco-restoration movement. Very valuable, a, a classic. Always coming home, Ursula Le Guin, whose parents were the anthropologists at UC Berkeley, the Krobers, and they wrote Ishi, the Last Man, which talks about hoop culture, which talks about uh, semi-itinerant landscape being on the land. Um, and then I'm going to mention a sort of dictionary, which is called Common Ground, Barry Lopez. Um, and there it is. There's some, there's some resources for, for how we learn to be place. All right. Now, the promised story that, that this Zoom was advertised for. 10 steps. Let's see if we can set this, let's see if we can set the stage. Um, it, like I said just before, it doesn't make sense anymore to keep moving on, to destroy a place and to move on. We need to like, we need to like stay. We need to like become people of place and make the adjustments, the adaptations that that's going to take. We need to do this for the sake of the whole planet. 
And, um, and I'm not talking here about hyper-individualistic survivalism. I'm talking about cooperative cultures. This is America, we're still living in America, but we need to create or remember or bring together this whole new way of relating to the land, of being the land, of understanding who our mother is. And, um, and so it's almost like musical chairs, except we all now have not got a chair. <clears throat> and yet we need to stay. Um, there's no, I'm not making any promises here. Let's be clear. This is kind of like time for me to reread the caveats that I read at the uh, beginning of this talk. And maybe we can return to those at the end. Um, our best chance is to adapt and become place-based people. And we keep repeating the mantra here, right? And, and here, um, you'll see it on our website, the icons that we're referring to for the new stories is um, beaver, salmon, and cultural fire. Fire is an entity, it has spirit. We need to start talking to fire, talking with fire. So these, these are sort of the icons that we, can, that we can create new dances around or understand the dances around. Um, and I'm gonna repeat that phrase here because bringing back, closing the nutrient loops Bringing back beaver, salmon, and cultural fire is the most enticing future, and it beckons us. This is, this is a story of hope and beauty, of moving forward. And, and so I'm hoping that this is the story that I'm telling and that this is useful for us to understand so that um, we can be inspired because, oh my gosh, we have things to do. Um, you, can, you can go to a wonderful book called, uh, by Sharon Blackie called If Women Rose Rooted to understand that the land itself is a woman. You can see that by the shape of the landscape. So this is why we refer to our mother being place itself. So I just wanted to, you know, make that comment about where we actually are, how we're doing this. And, um, and the other book that I didn't mention in my list, which I'll mention now, just before I go into the 10 steps, um, is Tom Doty, Doty meets Coyote. And that's local stories from the, from the Bear Valley, from Southern Oregon. Excellent. And we just lost him last year. So I honor Tom Doty, who's a good friend of mine. Sorry we lost him. But at least we have his book, which I highly recommend to people in Southern Oregon and Northern California, the Klamath and the, I don't like to use the name, and Dragonflies River which is the river in Southern, the big river system in Southern Oregon. The name of the river you see on the maps is a racist slur. We should not be referring to the river that way. In fact, the Quaker meeting I'm a member of now in, in, uh, is called South Mountain Meeting. It changed its name when it got clear as to what that name actually referred to. And that was a process we went through. And now I believe the Quaker meeting is going through further understanding of acknowledging where it is that we new settlers are now. So I have written this essay. Um, I guess it'll be on our webpage at some place, these 10 steps to becoming people of place. Everything is changing. What to do? become people of place. The most enticing future beckons. So there it is. 
There's the bumper stickers, okay? The first thing we need to do is state the intention. We're sticking around and we're gonna do the work. And I think we should do that with some ceremony. And I think we should write some songs. And I think we should tell our children we're sticking around. This is where we want to be and this is where we're going to be. And that's big. That's a big thing to state that intention, to be that clear. Sing the new songs. Number two. Learn the names and the stories of all beings of place. That'll keep you busy. Education. Dig in. I keep saying that because it's a lovely phrase. Um, we have a lot to learn. And learning directly from nature is going to teach us huge things. And if you read creation stories, or if you hear creation stories even better, or even better dance creation stories, you're gonna learn from place. The storylines, and you can read things about Australian Aborigines and storylines and how deep that story is, really wonderful. We have the same thing here. We have a lot we can learn every place. I'm trying to, uh, excuse me if I keep being local, local. I'm trying to be general for anyone wherever they are. Um, uh, but we should speak and sing gratitude to all our relations because we're all in this together and we can't do it without a lot of help. We should be listening. We need a lot of humility. We're going to make more mistakes. We already made a lot of mistakes. We're going to make more. We should be humble about that. We can learn. We can. One of the big principles of David Holmgren is accept feedback. Mm, good one. Yeah. Accept feedback. Um, there are many stories without humans at the center of the story. Not most of the stories should not be about humans. They should be about place, about creation. So let's put ourselves in the right perspective, in the relative location, in the right relation. We're idiots. We don't know what we're doing. We're doing the best we can. Please forgive us. Forwards. All right. Number three. Learn what happened where you are now. They don't teach this in school. You're going to have to do some work. Ask around. And don't go to people of color and First Nations people and ask them to educate you. You need to get your act together and do your research and find out what happened. You need to know this. We all need to know this. Place already knows what happened. And if we're going to be people of place, we should know the story of place. Big work. What does it mean to be traumatized? And how do we recover from trauma? Certainly forest bathing, uh, Shinroko, I'm close. Um, thank you for the Japanese lead on that, is a good one. Also sit spots, go sit with a tree, a lot of time in nature, very healing. The land itself is traumatized. We should listen to the land's trauma and understand what we can all do to help each other. This is the work. This is the work about learning what happened where you are 
now. Number four, this is a lot of people's favorite. <clears throat> Stay home and dress up. Yeah, um, don't be traveling around all over the place. <laughs> except by walking or something. Learn your own drainage basin first. There's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of tourism you can do in your neighborhood. You know, you don't have to go that far. There's a lot of interesting stuff. So stick around. And when I say dress up, I mean fiber sheds. So there's water sheds, which we call drainage basins. There's also fiber sheds. What are the clothes of place? How well made are they? What, I mean, I mean, as, as civilization and globalism collapse, we're gonna have a lot of toys to play with for a little while. Great, we can have like dress up parties or something, but ultimately I want you to, I want to recommend that we stay home and dress up, dress up as people of place. What does that look like? Cause there's gonna be markers on, we're going to be wearing the markers of our skills, of our clan, of our people, of our place. That's dressing up. That's really dressing up. Then we know each other when we meet each other. And the land recognizes us because we're reflecting back to place that we are people of place by being part of place. So, Stay home and dress up. Number five, travel outside your drainage basin seldom. I've been doing um, watershed boundary, drainage basin boundary pilgrimages. I've done the Ashland watershed pilgrimage 12 times. And, um, and so, I recommend that you start with doing pilgrimages in your own drainage basin, in your own neighborhoods. Learn where you are. Learn what it looks like from up high, from down in the bottom. Reopen the trails. There are now local trail associations reopening. Some trails, of course, are ancient trails. Some trails are put in for nefarious reasons like mining, all okay? right? But we can get that together. Um, Tend the hoop, do the seasonal work. Uh, learn to love to travel in your own drainage basin. Be here. And then eventually we will be sending emissaries and we'll be going as cultural visitors into other drainage basins so that we can learn about what our neighbors are doing over the mountain range. And of course, again, I'm talking about Southern Oregon and Northern California, which is a little complicated geologically. It's called the Klamath Knot for a reason. So there's lots of drainage basins. Learn them, the ones where you are. Number six, reduce. Reduce energy import dependence. This is important and it's really hard for us to understand. We're all dependent on imported energy, on imported everything. And we've got a big change to do to become people of place. It's huge. What do we eat? How do we be here? What is our energy? Well, it's there. And we have an amazing, uh, ironic gift right now which is huge amounts of standing carbon as fuel hazard that we need to thin and reduce in order to reintroduce cultural burning. And all that carbon is a one-time occupation. The next one or two generations of people in Ecotopia are going to be doing forestry work and it's going to be hard but we're going to end up with charcoal and we're going to end up with building materials and we're going to end up with more and more medicinals and better water systems. And so this is reduce import energy import dependency. Mm. 
you know, that's a whole subject in and of itself, but it's part of becoming people of place. Got to change how we do things. Uh, bicycles, bicycle repairs. We should be like stashing bicycle parts, you know? We should like be able to fix them because, and I don't know what we're going to do for tires, but we'll work on it. Um, um, number seven. Consider what ecological restoration might mean. I'm going to quote Dennis Martinez and the Indigenous Peoples Restoration Network. Restoration to what? What are you thinking? Restoration? We're in dynamic change. The planet is changing. What Dr. John Yu says is, we should be talking about ecosystem services, not restoration of classic landscapes, not parks and stuff. No, ecosystem services. And that's going to be invented from scratch. And it might even in, involve exotic plants. I mean, I don't know where, how far we want to go with this, but we need to have this conversation. What exactly are we doing? Where are we going? How are we doing this? Beaver, salmon, and cultural fire. We don't know what we're doing. We need to be nimble in our tending so that we can have enough stability to keep working. We need to start understanding carrying capacity. We need to be understanding how to use as little as possible, to be as humble as possible as humans, to share the resources because biodiversity, uh, we don't, this is what Aldo Leopold taught us in Sand County Almanac. When you want to fix something, the first thing you do is don't throw away any of the pieces. We don't understand as humans what's going on. And we never will. It's complex. So we better get our perspective together here and tread lightly and do what we can to take care of ourselves so we can keep working so that all beings of place are honored. Because that's what it's going to take. That's what restoration might be meaning. This is where we're going. All right. And actually, I trespassed into the next number eight, which is support biodiversity, which I just told you about. And uh, learn what can be done to support biodiversity. And that's uh, riparians. Uh, riparian uh, is the uh, streamside forests. Um, a lot of mosaics, complex ecosystems across the complex geologies and soils. Um, maybe we could learn to move some things around. We can move salmon around. If there are surplus eggs, we can move those eggs. We can make artificial uh, reds or gravel nests in our local creeks. We can put those eggs in our local creeks and the smolt that survive will come back to that creek. This is how we get return of salmon. Not nurse, not, um, uh, what do they call those? <laughs> trying to remember where they raise artificial salmon in state hatcheries, that's it, fish hatcheries. We need to be more clever with biodiversity than trying to apply industrial methods. Industrial methods do not work. The backup disc. All right, Melanie, I've got a I've got a message here. All right, um, and then number nine. It's not being just anymore. Okay, get rid of it. Thank you. Hello, there. Um, Zoom glitch. Zoom glitch alert. Um, number nine. Read. The treaties. I'm looking forward to a collection of the treaties that were negotiated. 
I haven't seen that book yet for Southern Oregon and Northern California. I really want to read these treaties. I've seen pieces. I've heard about them. They were negotiated. They're, they're beautiful language. They're, they're highfalutin. And they were done with perfidy by the white people, but they were, they were negotiated in good faith by the sovereign First Nations people as they were being removed. We need to see these treaties. We need to know these treaties so that we can be ready to talk. Again, this is an example of white people or people of other cultures or new settlers doing their own education, finding things out about place. And then last, number 10, is establish drainage basin councils. So now the, the colonial, imperialistic, globalistic way that things are organized is completely for industrial extraction. It, it doesn't have to do with place. And we need to reorient ourselves to be thinking in a bioregional uh, model, in a drainage basin model. And that means uh, drainage basin councils or watershed councils as they're called often. Um, and let me be a little clear about this. In the rest of the world, watershed means the boundary line on the ridge around a drainage basin. And the drainage basin is the collection basin where the rivers and the creeks come out of. Only in America, apparently, do we refer to watersheds as the drainage basin. So let's change that language. I'm talking about drainage basin councils, not watershed councils. Luckily, Oregon has had a little head start because the governor's office actually supported what they called um, watershed councils. So there are in somebody's closet, in a location near you, lots of maps, maybe even notes of meetings. Let's hope we can find these things. Let's hope we can get these things together because we need to start talking in these buckets, in these basins. We need to come together in this rational ecological structure, which is a drainage basin. And then we need to do our work based on the place. And the place will teach us if we pay attention. And with any luck, we'll get a little help. And that's a couple of things which I'm not gonna go into a lot tonight unless the questions come through. Traditional ecological knowledge and indigenous ecological knowledge. Interestingly, all of us, no matter what culture we came from, as new settlers, we brought some traditional ecology, ecological knowledge with us in the form of stories, uh, sayings, uh, practices, and those practices, that traditional ecology, ecological knowledge that we bring with us as new settlers came from that place where our ancestors lived. So that's part of our education is tracking down what we still carry that's useful from our ancestors as traditional ecological knowledge. Indigenous ecological knowledge is completely place-based. It does not travel. We should not be asking about it. It cannot be taken apart piece by piece. You can go to the, to the Karuk website on the Klamath River and right at the top of their website, it says, oh, you new settlers, don't be coming around and trying to cherry pick us. Everything that we do is in a cultural context. You can't just look at what we're doing and think that you can copy it. It's way more complex than that. It's way more complicated than that. You need to learn cultural ways, spiritual ways first, before you start doing things. You're going to make mistakes without context. So that's how we put this together. We have to learn from our ancestors. 
We have to learn from place. We have to go through these steps. We have to bring our children with us as we do this. It's, it's a process. And it doesn't happen overnight. We're, we're doing it. And we're doing it. <laughs> Let me add that. And we're doing it. So we're moving forward. We're seeing what we can do. And once we have become cultures of place through drainage basin thinking and culture building and work, then we're ready to build new treaties of mutual aid with adjacent drainage basins. In the meantime, if we do have new relations after having educated ourselves with First Nations people, they certainly should be given all that rights, traditional rights that I spoke of at the beginning of this story, their rights, the cultural use of their traditional places, their, unse uh, their, unceded, uh, ter uh, their unceded territories and their intact sovereignty as First Nations. But we're not, we're not ready to have that conversation until we do this work that I'm telling these stories about tonight. We gotta, gotta get our own act together and we gotta learn where we are, following these, these clues that I've put together. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to have had this all come together for me to be able to tell you these stories that I've just told you. I feel very privileged to have had the education that I've had, to have been raised in my traditional Quaker tribe, as it were, culture. I want to thank my parents and my grandparents back now 10 generations. I want to thank my grandchildren. I want to carry these stories and I would like to persist myself. I would like to help. I would like to stick around. I want to continue to learn how to become people of place, not a person of place, but people of place. Thank you. I hope this was useful. Maybe we can have some questions in conversation now. Um, but I actually made it through all eight pages of my notes. So thank you for your patience. I hope this was entertaining or at least enlightening. Thank you. All right, Karen, what have we got? Any questions or comments? Great job, Hazel. Um, there really aren't any questions questions let's see um scroll Hi, through <laughs> i will say hazel yes karen, karen has been um putting in links to some of the books oh good good and i missed a few but um anyway Okay. And Simon says that we're digesting what you just shared. So <laughs> maybe we should have maybe we should have a little Quaker meeting here for a couple of three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> some deep breaths and some, I just yeah. I just took up my <laughs> meeting just, just took up the whole meeting. meeting. We didn't have any time to digest. I get that. All right. Um, uh, shall I read the yeah, I was going to say, so there was a question of whether this will be available on audio and this, um, this whole presentation is being recorded, so it will be available as video and the link will be, get sent out in a few days. There's a couple of documents that will be on the website that are associated with this storytelling tonight. Nice. 
a few a few of you I know I'm going to be working with this winter. I'm looking forward to that. Come and visit our place here. Sci Moon, yay! Thank you. All right. Anything else? I can I can read that list of resources again. You want me to do that, Karen? Those books. Yeah. Um, sure. There's there is a question. Natasha is wondering how how can we get involved? Where where you are? How can you get involved where you are? Um, well, that starts with a club. Well, actually, actually, I what we did in Ashland here in the um, late '80s was salon, the art of conversation. And um, Salon comes out of women during the French Revolution. Um, and it's a whole protocol of having a conversation and avoiding arguments, sharing without big fights. And one of the rules is what one says should have something to do with what has been said before. So continuity, honor, gentleness with each other, different ways to participate. So it's a whole different way of conversation. And, um, and we have a poster that we have, which are the rules of Salon. And Utney Reader used to do Salon. So there's books on Salon out there. Um, so I highly recommend that you start with Salon. Get your neighbors together and have a really open, wide ranging conversation that brings everything to the table so that people get to express themselves, their, their passions and their interests come forward. And yet it's done in a really uh, culture building way, a polite way, um, so, that we, so that we come to honor each other and honor where we are. And maybe your salon is called a salon of place. So you have that theme and you can, you can move from there. So look up Salon. Um, at some point, I'm, I'll, I'll put in, I think there is a poem and an article on Salon on our website. There used to be. So if not, we'll try to get that up there. But I do, I think that's a great way to start. It really worked for us here in Ashland. Um, there's an article recently published in the magazine, the online magazine Grist, and it's about the Ashland watershed and how different, different cultures came together to do fuel hazard reduction to, to help Ashland out. And although they don't mention me, my fingerprints are all over that article. So um, um, you could read that article from Grist, which is something about fuel hazard reduction in the Ashland watershed. You could search for Ashland or something. So that's a, that's a fresh article that's up. That would, that would be useful, that you could use as a model to think about. In Portland, um, the Bull Run Watershed also has a, mem a memorandum of understanding like uh, Ashland has, 1929 memorandum of understanding, allowed the city of Ashland to actually participate, uh, to, to coordinate with the Forest Service and affect how the Forest Service was doing the uh, fuel hazard reduction, which was really important because uh, the environmentalists in Ashen were not going to let too much bad stuff happen. And everyone had to change. The Forest Service, the city, the environmentalists, me, we all had things to learn and we all had to change in order to do the work that got done. So it's kind of a a thrilling article for me to read. It was really quite interesting. Yeah. Okay. I went on for a little bit there. You asked me a question, I go sideways. So now there are some questions for you, ah, Hazel. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. How can we organize and coordinate ourselves? Those of us that wanting to create a place-based culture and um, can you speak to the current, um, I think this is back to the land movement and how new settlers can support transition from private property, especially in urban areas? Land trusts. Um, I, I, there's still a place, 
while we're in transition, remember my, my rubric here is quick fix, retrofit, ultimate. Mostly I've been talking about ultimate vision here. And you just ask you a question about retrofit. There's no quick fixes to becoming a people of place, no shortcuts. Um, so we need nonprofits, um, parades, um, uh, art, um, uh, maps, a whole different type of map, um, uh, tours, bicycle tours. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things we can do, but in order to do that, we first need to cooperate. And this has been a problem um, in the Holy Ketopian experiment is siloing uh, different nonprofits, not talking to each other and not talking to other entities like city governments. And um, so there's a mapping exercise, a cultural mapping exercise to understand what the resources are, the cultural resources that we have, how we can work with each other, whether we can like put together a watershed council and invite delegates, not representatives, delegates, that's a spokes council idea, bring delegates together into these watershed councils. What have we got to bring to the table? What, what kind of a library can we put together? What sort of educational experiences can we put together? Um, in Ashland in the uh, late 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s, I taught at the Ashland Wilderness Charter School. I, I worked with the elementary schools. Uh, so, so working with the schools, volunteering in schools, bringing in ecological knowledge and knowledge of place, big, really valuable. I, I think this putting these libraries together, because a lot of the books that I mentioned here, I don't think you're gonna find them in your local library. So, you know, finding these resources is like some work, getting out there, tracking them down, putting them together. I'm, I'm trying to get my new book out on social forestry with its giant bibliography. Uh, I need some help on that, but we're working on it. So, that's sort of my short answer. Did I kind of answer that question, Karen? What part did I did not get to? I can't hear you. You're I'm muted. a little bit dis distracted with, with the chat. So okay. um, um, let's see. I am going to continue down. Um, Hey, you loved when you talked about playing dress up to become people of place, and that way we learn much more about each other. Yes. Um, let's see. And you talked about private property oh. and um, reforms. Yeah. Well, that's going to be tricky, isn't it? But guess what? There's been a buying binge. Private property has been consolidating within corporations. These corporations are brittle, to use an ecological term. Globalization is collapsing, folks. And we're trying to become people of place. So I think property definitions and property ownership is kind of up for grabs right now. It's a mess. And it's crazy. It's all debt-based. It's not, um, for example, the little Applegate where I live, the land prices are speculative. They have nothing to do about carrying capacity or productive capacity. And I hate using that term productive capacity because that implies industrial extraction. So everything changes, it's complex. We need to map this in a three-dimensional rubric. Um, what, I've, you know, what I've been saying in the conversation I had with Peyush a few months ago, uh, we have all these posters at Siskiyou Permaculture that kind of are icons of the complicated things I've been talking about. I think when we sit down in Salon, when we sit down in Watershed Council, we should be surrounded by the icons of complexity in order to keep our humility. And in order to be able to point at things like, oh, let's not forget that. And isn't it connected to this over here? So. Um, making these artworks, making these posters that are like 
expressive in their colors and their patterns and having them around us and sitting with them as if they're part of the conversation, they're entities in them themselves. That's a very unquakerly comment because the Quakers are into plainness and spirit and keeping it clean and not worshiping images. But I'm talking about memory aids, basically. How can, how can we help ourselves? How can we like paper our surrounds when we're sitting in these salons so that we're reminded of how much is actually going on. And that's, we've had some pretty good luck with that. There's 40 posters in my book right now. So forwards with that. Okay, Karen, other comments or questions? Yes, there, there are comments and questions. Um, so Delia has Hi, a, Delia. a comment. Ooh. Um, it says, Hazel, your deep insights are so replenishing. I can tell you that the city I live in, Albany, California, just voted to recognize our local tribe by a public acknowledgments, incorporating native participant patient in the parks and recs department and paying an annual tax to their land trust. Progress. So that's cool. I, I, um, the last, let me make a comment on that. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I went to, oh God, two years ago now, I went to the Eco Farm Conference um, down in Asilomar, and um, there was a presentation there about farmers realizing that they needed hedgerows and that they needed to be tending their um, riparian zones and that they should be planting native plants. And then bells started to go off, ding, 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 ding. And they went, oh, let's invite the uh, remnant uh, persistent still here First Nations into cultural tending. Oh, here we have these hedgerows, we have this riparian zone. Please, <laughs> you have access to this. What else would you like us to plant? Is there anything we can do to help? What, what do you need? Basketry, medicinals, berries, we're into it. So that was wonderful. I, that, that, that cheered me up to see that presentation. Thank you. Okay. So Hazel, there's um, been some questions on Salon and they're really, I mean, I did a quick Google search to see if there was a website that had information on how to hold Salon. Um, and I'm realizing we don't have that poster scanned or we would post it. <laughs> so yeah. um, would you go into Salon just a little bit more of like how, how does one hold Salon? Um, you know, the most important thing, which fits right in with what I'm saying is in Salon, it's almost like you're talking to place, not any individual humans. But the way that it's practiced is you're talking to everybody in the room. You're not talking to any other specific person. And that's written up on the poster as avoid dialogue. Avoid getting into back and forth with one other person. Well, guess what? We've all been trained to do that, to debate, right? To, to like fight with each other. You have, we, in order to have Salon pulled off, you have to learn this. And the Quakers know this. The Quakers have learned how to do this. Um, you need to speak to everyone present, to all entities present, to spirit that's present. And that's a big one. And then connect what you say, but it can be creative. You could go sideways. Somebody says something that triggers you. Well, it's a bad word to use. That inspires you to, uh, to say, oh, that reminds me of, and then you tell a little story and that inspires somebody else. And then the next time you come back to Salon, maybe someone who doesn't want to talk brings a painting they did or brings some craft work they did that was inspired by the previous global conversation that develops in Salon. And it's really amazing when Salon works, the room just gets filled with light. I mean, 
it's like, oh, wow, we're actually talking to each other and this is fun. So um, let me think what some of the other rules are. Oh, um, if there's too much popcorn, you might want a talking stick. <laughs> it might be in the middle of the room. When I did this, when I taught Salon in 1994 in South Africa and the revolution was still going on, um, the people of South Africa were thrilled because all the conversations they had had previously were, were desperate revolutionary emergency conversations. And I gave them permission to play. Oh my God, they loved it. So we had a toy dinosaur in the middle of the room and they were like, I wonder how one eats a dinosaur. Mm. And pretty soon I couldn't participate. They were being so funny. I was rolling on the floor laughing. So, I mean, Salon is just so creative. It, it frees us up and then things come out of that. We get to learn each other and, and we learn and we kind of learn some shorthand. You know, we, we we're able, oh, I can say that. Um, all indigenous, this is a big statement, all indigenous languages of place are phraseologies. They're not vocabularies. And, and the Quakers do this. When you say like, walk in the light, friend, you're referring to a story. It's a talk that George Fox gave 400 years ago. And if you were raised as a kid, you go, oh, right, that's that story. So when phrases get repeated, they're shorthands for traditional ecological knowledge, for, for, for wisdom. And so that's very interesting when phrases, when you learn what phrases are and how they work culturally. Again, don't be atomizing, don't be taking things out of context. We need to like understand complicatedness and, and it's wonderful. Complexity is beyond our understanding. That's how ecology works. It's complex. Complicated is what humans do trying to deal with complexity. We do complicated things. So we can like make more, be more clear about our words. We can like learn that vocabulary. Thus, be, thus we become people of place because we develop a language of place. And it should start to appear as phrases rather than atomized words. All right, I went off, but that helps. Uh, other stuff in salon. Um, yeah, sit in the circle. <laughs> um, um, we'll get that up. We'll, we'll scan, we'll take a photo of that poster and we'll put it up on our website because there's like 30, there's 30 recommendations on that poster. So we'll, we'll work on that. We'll get that up. Yeah. Yeah. I love salon. It's good. Okay. Anything else? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's getting thicker. <laughs> um, so Angie asks, what are examples of mis mistakes you have made as you have been becoming a person of place? And how have you reconciled those situations? <laughs> mm. <clears throat> I am humble. I have made mistakes. I am an idiot. Please forgive me. Um, you can watch a link on our website to um, an 11 minute video produced by Oregon State University, Andrew Millison, um, about Wolf Gulch. And it's my alter ego, that Tom guy. And um, when I developed that farm 22 years ago, I made a big mistake. I looked at the down cut creeks that were incised into the land, destroying whatever the beavers had done for tens of thousands or millions of years. And I said, oh my God, it floods here. Look at this down cutting. And so I over-designed the spillways. I made sure there was no way that soil would leave the place. All of that worked great for frost, but I was an idiot. The down cutting was from the mining days. And it took living on that place for a while to figure out that that was all done with dynamite and flash floods from these mining canals that were up on the mountain above us. I had no idea. 
It took me a while to figure that out. Oh, oh, that's what I'm seeing. Oh, hmm. <laughs> I could have done better if I had figured that out, if I had seen it more clearly. So we make every time we jump to a conclusion, we're probably making a mistake. <laughs> One should consider that we're making a mistake. Um, so observation, um, the permaculture principle is prolonged and careful observation rather than hasty and thoughtless work. Don't blow it. Pay attention. So that's a good example of having made a mistake. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, yeah, let's move on. <laughs> I, could, I could tell other ones, but they're like, uh. um, oh, I got a good one. This one's great because it's cross-cultural. Um, at the last graduation ceremony I went to at DQ University, I noticed that the First Nations people were wearing their regalia to the ceremony, to the graduation ceremony. Um, and so I decided to show up in Quaker plain clothes. And I showed up and the elders from the Hoopa tribe were there in the room and they stared at me during the entire ceremony. And I felt like, uh-oh, what did I do? Only like decades later did I realize I looked like the missionaries. I was wearing traditional plain clothes from the 19th century and they remembered those missionaries. And I don't think those missionaries did a great job. <laughs> I think there was serious trouble, even if they were Quakers. Cause that was the other branch of Quakers, not the Hicksites, but I blew it. And how would I have known better? I, I, wore my, I wore my regalia. I wore my traditional costume. And it turned out to be a mistake. These things are tricky. We need to learn a lot. This is like not easy. I was like, oh, I should like ask permission before I do something like that. Would have been smart. But I learned something, you know, and we can learn from our mistakes. It's not a total loss, but um, I'm a little embarrassed by that to this day. And that was 35 years ago, you know? So, <clears throat> sorry, I apologize. I'll, I'll ask permission next time. Or I'll explain myself why I'm doing it, you know? So, <clears throat> It's probably a useful story. Let's not blow it. Let's be careful. Don't go, don't go dressing up as, as indigenous people. Don't do it. Not smart. Be yourself. Be your own culture. Figure out what dressing up and staying home means where you are. <clears throat> I apologize. Sorry, I blew it. My mistake. Is that useful? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do you want to say anything about the different um, levels of mistakes? <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, so I make at least 100 mistakes a day. Easy. No problem. But those are, those are class three mistakes. They're the ones you should be making because you learn from them. It's like, oh, I did that. Mm, it didn't come out like I thought it should. Uh, that was a mistake. Okay, I won't do that again. Okay, class two mistakes are serious. You've done some damage and you should be horribly, horribly embarrassed instead of, oops, you should be like, oh shit. And, um, and but they can be fixed. You have to work. That's called retrofit. So class three errors, quick fix, you're good. Class two errors, they're going to require some retrofit. You just did some damage. <clears throat> Get your act together. Class one errors, you just really blew it and it can't be fixed. So you need to avoid class 
one errors. And the only way you do that is traditional ecological knowledge. It turns out the mathematics of how you find what is missing is not easy. The only way you know what is missing is through traditional stories. That's why traditional stories exist. They kind of hold these mistakes. They hold them in. The, the thing my mother told me, after the summer of 1816 and froze to death, we made some big mistakes and we couldn't fix them. Our culture was destroyed. And it's true, I'm a refugee. I'm so happy there's a remnant of my people in my traditional village, but we really blew it. It was class one errors. So those are the three levels. I, I don't know if I got the one, two and three thing right, but I like it that way. Class one errors, don't even go there. Class two, you ought to be horribly embarrassed. Class three, don't be embarrassed. Get your act together. <laughs> go, oh. I just learned something. Mm. Okay. Great. Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, David asked a question. I wonder about establishing security of being able to stay in place. If the only options are renting or high mortgage payments, making eviction a constant threat, coping with the stress of insecurity or the loss of rights of being rooted in place, how do we address this and what strategies are there? Go camping. I'm oh, sorry. Um, we really should, God, that's really hard. Thank you for the question. I, it's, the, it's the real question. It's those caveats I read at the beginning of, of the, tonight's story. Let me see if I can find my caveat page because I kind of like talked about that. Gotta be here someplace. Where's my caveats? Here they are. Um, yeah, well, we were able to form communes when we were poor, poor freaks. I never was a hippie. I was a freak. Okay. Um, we're going to be going through transition here now where because everything's going through the roof and where are we going to live? I think we're going to be homeless for a while but until we start squatting. And um, there's an autonomian movement and a history in Europe about squatting in brownfields and abandoned. Right now in America, I predict <clears throat> huge amounts of abandoned commercial uh, infrastructure, um, real estate, giant amounts of huge buildings that are useless. We should squat, move in and then start tearing them down and building a whole new type of life. And like a lot on the West Coast, a lot of our cities are in valley bottoms and the traditional First Nations villages were never in the valley bottoms or very seldom, except where there was good flow. But wherever the fogs um, showed up, um, the, you would get sick. So we need to like move into small villages up above the valley bottoms, above the fog, below the snow lines. And how are we gonna do that? That's gonna take a while. That's gonna take unimaginable changes. So I'm sorry, but your question is absolutely pertinent. This is a crazy situation. We need to help each other. We need to like be able to offer some space, especially those in the country, a lot of organic farms don't have enough workers. Like I was saying earlier on tonight about uh, farms having untended woodlands. And so we put camps together on organic farms and there's some turnover. Well, we need some culture to do that because we just can't have random people coming in. We don't know what they're bringing with them. So this is pretty tricky. There actually are cultures of homeless people, one of them is called the Travelers. And I don't know if they're still in action. Um, another are hobos, right? Riding the rails. Um, these people know each other and they don't let just anybody come into camp with them. So this is like first 
form your cohorts, then figure out what you're going to do. Maybe you do need to go camping. Maybe you need to ask permission to go camping. And if you're camping on private land, offer some work. Don't leave a mess. Um, maybe we start to do some pretty crazy things. So um, be creative, as, uh, as David just said, you know, let's be creative. How are we gonna do this? I mean, I'm, I'm in trouble right now. My, my whole village has been given a maybe selling order and I'm trying to figure it out. But again, camping skills, I, I wish you all had been through um, scouting and not Boy Scouts, not Girl Scouts, scouting. We, we all should like build up our basic skills. Yeah. And, and, and let's, let's learn about hoop culture. Simon just checked it and I've learned from him, them. I've learned from them. So um, there are ways, but I don't, you know, this talk tonight is about becoming people of place. And I don't like the idea of living in our cars and driving around. So it's tricky. How are we going to do this? We should be negotiating. I, in, my, in my talk on social forestry that I gave earlier this year, um, I recommended that even in urban areas, there's a tremendous amount of forestry work that needs to be done. Maybe we can negotiate with the city to have temporary homeless camps as long as the camp is about work or is about tending. And maybe those homeless camps are given the permission to have a camp government and screening of who's there and backup because uh, we really need some backup. We're not gonna just be able to, to move into the new world without some medical support. I think we're gonna need food aid at some point. Um, Who's got, who's got some lifeboats that they've put together? I've got a lifeboat I put together. I don't know if I'm going to get to be able to deploy it. So we're all faking it right now. Let's be creative. Let's, let's move. Let's move forward, as I keep saying. Yeah. <laughs> we want to be in place. And that's ultimate thinking. And let's keep that in mind. And let's work on it. I'm I am thinking about stewardship contracts, a kind of a new form of reservation. Oh, we're going to be doing ecological restorations on this mix of uh, ownership on this uh, drainage basin system, and uh, we need this camp. And I actually negotiated these types of things with the Forest Service in Ashland when I worked with the uh, Wilderness Charter School, they said, oh yeah, we can put you in a group camp while you're doing roadside clearing. And you can be there for a certain amount of time. If you, if you have a gathering permit, which I don't recommend with federal land, you can stay in one place for 30 days. You can put this camp together. And if you negotiate it with the local ranger district or something, they might provide you with some support. They might bring you water tanks. I mean, this is actually, there's some good news here. I have some precedent. I have negotiated these things with Linda Duffy, who's in that, uh, who's in that article in, um, in um, Grist that I mentioned. So there, there's some things, road, all the roadsides on federal land in the West have had an environmental assessment. And that allows grazing on the roadside, camping on the roadside, uh, a collection of certain types of materials. Um, it hasn't been renegotiated. It hasn't been developed. And a lot of federal agencies are out of money. All their money's going into forest fire repression and they could use some help. They could use some campground tending. They could use some roadside maintenance. They could use some trail building. We should be negotiating. We should be going, oh, we don't need to be paid, but could you please give us some place-based activities that we can uh, use? Um, and uh, we'll do the best we can, and we'll speak for ourselves, and we'll govern ourselves. Thank you very much. Can we make a treaty of mutual aid? Can we, please? We'd love it. We're looking forward. Thank you very much. Onwards. All right. I
That's what I do, right? I tell stories. But at least I can tell you, I've done some of these things. I've negotiated some of these things and they have stepped forward with help. Of course, I have all these credentials, but all right, that's complicated. All right, but I hope I said something useful. Mm. All right, what else you gonna throw at me? <laughs> So, um, so there's some questions about watershed, but I'm going to skip that for a moment. And um, because this is sort of related to what you were just talking about. And um, Tia is asking, do you see a pathway of gradual and fast changes or adaptations that um, doesn't include a lot of death and people in war? Um, so how can we transition in a in a more peaceful way? Well, actually, the knowledge is there. There are ways to do it, but people freak out. They get fearful. So if there, if there's a way to calm people down by saying, "No, we can do this," but we need to be we need to do X, Y, and Z then maybe we can come together in an emergency situation without a tremendous amount of conflict and blow up. And um, one of the things, again, from my own family history is um, if the trucks stop running in America, the supermarkets are out of food in two to three days. Is everybody ready for that? Probably not. But there are certain tree needles, barks, and leaves that can be fermented or made into soups that will keep you alive while you plant crops locally. So that's squatting for agriculture in order to grow our food. And if the whole community that's in that place after disaster has forced us into community gets their act together and convinces everybody, look, calm down, we can do this. We just need to do this, this, and this. It can be done. It has been done in the past. It, it, it's, it's not pretty, but you can get through. Um, my gross thing that I say is the Donner Party did not have to be doing cannibalism. They were surrounded by food. They were just idiots. And so place knowledge. This is why I'm telling this story. Ten steps. One of the things you got to learn is every plant, how they work, <laughs> what are the medicines, what can you eat in an emergency? I mean, this stuff we need to know. And I think it can be done. I don't, I'm, I've been asking in a collapse, in the coming collapse of globalization and civilization, what are the institutions and what are the, what, who are the leaders that actually can step forward and get respect and support? I don't have an easy answer to that. It used to be the churches, but I don't know who it is now. I think it's going to be emergent. And I do, I do recommend that book, Emergent Strategies by Adrienne Brown. Um, she gives us some ideas about that. But first, we should have cohorts. We shouldn't be thinking about this as hyper-individualistic competitors. We need to have our cohorts. We need to have our little sub-tribes. We need to be combining with our neighbors and doing things now to learn how to do things when we really need to do things. And the Little Applegate's been doing that. Community inventory is a process. And I think there's an article on our website about community inventory. Um, um, uh, art and placements. We just put up a bus stop in downtown Crump. Yeah, downtown Crump now has a Crump stop. And um, so there's things we can do in the meantime. Uh, put a farm store in on a farm. Help out uh, to build culture. Because <coughs> it's culture that hangs together and keeps going. 
I mean, what I said in my last storytelling or two or three back, whatever it is, don't eat any potatoes. All those potatoes need to be planted. You need to be drinking pine needles and Douglas fir needles. And those are the two big ones, by the way, Douglas fir and pine. So there's some quick answers. I mean, a lot of knowledge will be necessary and a lot of calmness and maybe some round dancing. I mean, we need to come together in order to keep calm, in order to keep going, in order to get through. Okay, I tried. I had something to say. I always have something to say. Some of you know that. Okay, what else you got? Um, so how do we get to know forest ecologies to the south or inland or lower than us? so that we can help those forests migrate, those forest migrants walk to our new place and find new homes and establish new relationships with them. Would you repeat the beginning of that again? How do we get to know forest ecologies to the south or inland or lower than us? So, I mean, I'm imagining this has to do with how um, climate change is changing our yeah, forest logical zones. Ecologies migrate. Yeah, sometimes fast. Um, through cultural exchange. Um, like uh, there you, again. How do we do it without traveling? Um, maybe we put book packages together, and we mail them as gifts. Maybe we find. Maybe we encourage through pen pals to put watershed councils together wherever people are and we start mutual aid and we start sending information. Um, maybe we learn to bicycle long distance in order to do this, but we certainly shouldn't be flying anymore unless of course it's a dirigible, really into dirigibles, airships. Um, read Kim Stanley Robinson. Um, you know, get inspired with science fiction. Um, you know, I mean, there's so much to learn. But yeah, that's it is a great question. And it's a very pertinent question. And definitely these I am at Wolf Gulch. I have planted buckeyes. I have planted gray pines. I'm hoping to plant currants. I'm moving California flora into Southern Oregon. Some die in the future. Somebody will say, how did these plants get here? Oh, well, Hazel did it. So yeah, you, we can start actually moving those cultural plants that we know about. All plants are cultural, but we can start moving the most known cultural plants up and north. And we can do it wherever we are. And we can put those nurseries together. And as part of our ecological restoration work, as discussed in our drainage basin council governments, or whatever you want to call them, uh, gatherings, councils, um, we can start doing that, planting that stuff out. Yeah. So get the seeds. Start, start sending the seeds north. Start sending the seeds up. Start doing seed collecting where you are. This is like, this is stuff we can do. Absolutely. So great question. Really, really good question. I actually came up with something. It took me a while, but I got there. Yeah. What else? Um, so I jumped over this one and um, Payush was wondering, what is the difference between watershed council and drainage basin council? Oh yeah. Well, watershed councils are government, are government entities that were supported by the state of Oregon. So they're kind of a prototype. I think that I'm suggesting shadow governments that are that I'm calling drainage basin councils. And I'm thinking they're different, that they operate differently. So watershed councils are where we go to do research, to find the maps that they've collected, also from environmental organizations like KS Wild and stuff. They have huge piles of maps. Um, and then, and then we evolve into a place-based, you know, completely a neighbor situation of working together 
where we are in the drainage basin we're in, even if it's a side drainage, a creek, not an entire river system. I think those are councils. And um, the Quakers did have a um, scale thing that they use, which is um, you need at least like eight or 10 people to do decent discussion or salon. Uh, 13 is great, 23 is all right. But by the time you get into 30, you should be breaking up into subgroups and sending delegates. So there's scales here. And if you look up Dunbar's numbers, he developed this long ago. It's an anthropologist about uh, the size, the number of people you actually can know, the number of people you can actually recognize, what your brain can handle. This is stuff we know, and we can scale what we're doing socially um, appropriately and uh, appropriate to place. And we can figure out um, what, so a drainage, a big drainage basin council is going to have delegates from side drainages that still have, you know, the right scale of humans in those side drainages. So, you know, this is, these are things, we have information, we can learn to do these things. Okay. Something else? So I just want to acknowledge that we're at nine o'clock oh, and oh, yes. there's, um, there's a lot of comments <laughs> and Helga mentioned the um, salons that used to happen in the library basin and that there was a person drawing pictures yes. on a chalkboard yeah. that was yeah. capturing artist, what yeah. was happening. Yeah. Wonderful. It was lovely. And, and now they do that. Now they do that at design conferences and stuff. There's an artist and the artist is drawing while people are talking. Works great. It's tremendous feedback. People really get inspired by seeing lines and patterns and, and colors. And, 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 and I mean, that's a skill. And certain artists are better at that than others, you know, but it's, it's really a wonderful contribution. Yeah. Thank you, Helen. Yeah. Okay. Whew. Boy. <laughs> and I'm going to drive home over a mountain range or around a mountain range. And I might not walk into my cabin. I might crash at my trailhead. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Forwards. Yeah. And Natasha, is that you who's coming to visit this weekend? Yeah, good. Looking forward to that. All right. Thank you all. Wonderful questions. Lovely to see some faces, even though this is like in the ethers, like I said. Here we are. And um, my bumper sticker for you is, it's pretty simple what we have to do. Surf and dodge. Go with the good stuff, dodge the bad stuff. Don't forget to breathe. Sit with nature. Thank you, friends. I love you all. May you become people of place. Blessings. Blessings to you all. Twinkle, twinkle, twinkle. Can I go home now? <laughs> Yay. We did it. Wonderful. Safe home, Hazel. <laughs> yeah. Here it goes. Forwards. Little by little, they're clicking out. Yeah. I'm reading the chat. Do you want to hear some of it? <laughs> Are we offline now? Um, We're still on, aren't we? Well, if I close it. Nice to see you, Miku. <laughs> if I, if I, if I close Hi, Angel. If you close it. Do you want me to turn you off so people don't hear you? Yeah, sure. Bye, thank you.